Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that we find you all safe and well. If this is your first time joining us for Fridays of Freelander. You've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh researchers, neurosurgeons, current and former residents. If you missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays of Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question into the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished former University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery residents Doctor and United States Air Force Major Philip Perry. As for that, Dr. Friedlander, thank you and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin, and it's uh, again a pleasure to be with all of you uh, today here. Um, as I usually do, I'd like to provide uh, some insight and thoughts on the current uh, COVID situation, as well as introduce our special speaker uh, today. Uh, uh, luckily, the number of uh, COVID positive patients within our institution continues to uh, gradually uh, decrease. We're still seeing a, a moderate number of uh, uh, patients, but as the vaccination rates uh, continue to increase and perhaps also as we're getting into the warmer weather, the number of um, positive uh, uh, patients uh, in the hospital has uh, gone down. Uh, again, I always urge all of our uh, listeners, that uh, if anybody needs to come to the hospital or contact your physician, do not hesitate uh, in doing so. We've seen uh, uh, too many people that just uh, take uh, too long to come to the hospital when there's a problem, and then uh, bad things uh, can happen. So again, uh, please come to the hospital, uh, call us. We're doing uh, many visits uh, through telemedicine, which uh, again, uh, aviates the need to come uh, to the hospital at all. And it's something that we'll continue to do uh, through the pandemic and, and afterwards. Uh, telemedicine has really been a wonderful um, um, extension of, uh, of uh, what we do. Uh, in addition, I uh, again feel very strongly and passionate about uh, the use of vaccines. I know uh, a significant uh, number of uh, people have uh, hesitations uh, to receiving uh, the vaccine. And uh, again, I've received it. My whole family has uh, uh, received it. And anybody that I that I talk to, I think that's going to be the best way to combat uh, this uh, this uh, terrible uh, epidemic. If you weigh the risk and benefits, there's there's not a hundred percent on either side. Nothing is a hundred percent safe. Uh, but what's 100% is that a significant uh, number of people that get COVID end up in the hospital, end up in a ventilator, people die, in, in addition, transmitting it uh, to other vulnerable and elderly uh, individuals uh, is more likely if you're not vaccinated. So again, I urge uh, everybody that uh, that has not uh, received the vaccine um, to go out and, and, uh, and, uh, and receive it as well. Now, uh, really, uh, it's a uh, pleasure to me to introduce uh, one of our uh, spectacular graduates uh, from our program, Dr. Philip uh, uh, Perry. Uh, uh, Phil was uh, uh, with us, graduated a number of years ago, and then uh, went and, and, and pursued his uh, uh, service uh, requirements uh, uh, with the military, and uh, that's a part of what he will uh, describe uh, uh, today. Phil has a wonderful and beautiful uh, family. Uh, which uh, uh, keeps him uh, occupied, and uh, I personally am extremely proud of what he's done, the kind of uh, individual and human uh, that he is. Our residents are, many of them are very different in, in many ways. Each one of them brings us uh, something uh, very special, but really uh, the pinnacle of that is uh, Philip, and uh, you know, I'm uh, delighted that he joined us uh, today. So, Dr. Perry, please uh, thank you for joining us and take it away. Pleasure to be here, Dr. Freelander. Thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, it's a it's an honor here uh, to be uh, with you all today on this Fridays with Freelander. Uh, Memorial Day weekend is upon us uh, this next Friday, and what better way to enter into that weekend than with a neurosurgery talk with a, a real life veteran uh, outside the VA, of course. 
I would like to talk to you all about my experience as the neurosurgeon for the soldiers, civilians, enemy combatants, contractors, international forces in Afghanistan during my tour of duty in 2016 as part of the Operation uh, Freedom Sentinel campaign. In many ways, my, uh, my residency at Pittsburgh had prepared me well for life in Afghanistan. Uh, things there were just a little bit more comfortable. Uh, for today's talk, I'd like to begin with a brief introduction regarding the United States role in the Afghan war, where we stand with this conflict today, and focus on the changing role we have played in the delivery of healthcare over the past 20 years while at war, focusing on, of course, the role of the neurosurgeon in theater, and particular to my experience, the role of the neuroendovascular surgeon while there. The Afghanistan war, uh, having started in October of 2001, has fallen so far from most Americans' consciousness that we have ironically already forgotten that Afghanistan is known as the Forgotten War. But why is this the case? Well, there is little uh, to want to remember about an event that has been dragging on in excess of 20 years, spanning over four presidencies in a geographically remote region, 13 and a half time zones away, 13,000 miles away, has cost an estimated $1.6 trillion since 2001 for a country that a majority of Americans know very little about politically and even less about culturally. And to illustrate that point, I'd imagine that few people could even pick out Afghanistan amongst the many other stand nations speckled about the Middle East. Uh, well, here is Afghanistan highlighted in red. It is a landlocked country between Iran to the west, Pakistan to the east and south, with Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan to the north, scattered amongst the Hindu Kish mountains. Uh, the Afghanistan war thus far is divided into two campaigns, uh, OEF or Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, which began in October of 2001 when the CIA and special forces teams began surgical infiltration operations to destabilize the Taliban's hold on Afghanistan. These actions quickly escalated to encompass a rapid increase in troop number with an international presence. We have since transitioned into OFS or Operation Freedom Sentinel, uh, beginning in January of 2015, which is about a year before I arrived. And the difference between those uh, two campaigns, um, I'll go over in the next few slides. The most notable difference in the two campaigns is in troop number. We now have a dramatic uh, decrease in the presence of boots on the ground in country under the current campaign of OFS. Extrapolated out to 2021, uh, as this graph ends uh, just after 2016, there are around 2,500 to 3,000 total troops in theater. Uh, this does not include the uh, myriad of uh, U.S. contractors in um, uh, the NATO forces in theater. From a healthcare perspective, the major difference between the two campaigns is the volume of cases being performed. Combat casualty care was provided with little to no limitation uh, to all of the participants in war. The, the ISAF, the enemy combatants, Afghan National Army, Afghan National P uh, Police or AMP, uh, civilian contractors or local nationals, all were eligible for care at the US run hospitals and theater during uh, this campaign. This included large number of humanitarian cases across many uh, surgical and medical specialties. Uh, the medical rules of engagement uh, during OEF were broad. Virtually anybody could receive care and medical care for those injured in the war or otherwise eligible is delivered at one of two locations, either in Kandahar or Bagram. Uh, and again, listed here, you can see the medical rules of engagement. Um, again, really anybody who had uh, a problem that could be taken care of by one of the many medical or surgical specialty roles. Um, it could be war related injuries, humanitarian, and, and again, uh, more than uh, the, the two main hospitals uh, were available to these uh, folks who met the uh, uh, MROs. Uh, contrasting the, uh, MRO, the medical rules of engagement or MROE uh, with OEFS and OEF, uh, the current campaign, which is Operation uh, Freedom Sentinel, um, and its objectives tell a completely different story. Um, the role of OFS uh, starting in 2015 is more of an advisory role. Uh, we support and train the Afghan National Army, Army and uh, we have really call, called on the, uh, the NATO-led forces uh, to incorporate them into a, an adjunct arm of OFS, which is called Operation Resolute Support. And this is the 43-led uh, coalition uh, network of uh, many countries throughout the, the world who have come together to help uh, advise, train, and support the Afghan National Army in order to have these uh, people protect themselves. 
Um, it's where, uh, so suffice to say, our, our current role in combat healthcare uh, is far more limited uh, in parallel to our uh, advisory role from a military perspective. The, the healthcare one is, is similar. Um, combat casualty care in, in this regard is uh, only delivered now at, at two combat hospitals, uh, one in Bagram and the other in, in Kandahar. And the medical rules of engagement under this new campaign of OFS uh, are, are very uh, discreet. It's uh, life, limb, and eyesight saving surgery only. Uh, there are no humanitarian uh, efforts. Um, there's limited subspecialty access to CJTH, which is the Craig Joint Theater Hospital. I'll explain that in a second. Um, and that's the dominant hospital and theater uh, located in the Northeast in Bagram. And, and access to the care, uh, because it is a um, uh, one of the, the major military bases, uh, it's an army base there, uh, it's, it's extraordinarily uh, restricted. Um, so uh, the it's worth mentioning how the military allocates its medical resources in theater underneath these uh, OFS uh, medical rules of engagement, um, limited as they may be now, uh, and it's allocated based on a system called echelons of care. So I'll, I'll address that briefly. Role one facilities or echelon one are facilities which have patient holding times limited to about three hours. They lack surgical capabilities uh, and their objective is to provide triage, emergent treatment and evacuation to a, a role of a, a, an echelon of care uh, of, of higher capability. And that would be a role two facility. Role two facilities are uh, mobile units that have an increased medical capability, basic general surgical services, some limited inpatient services, simple x-ray capabilities and essential transfu uh, transfusion services. And then the next role would be role three facilities, which offer the highest level of care available in what's called the AOR. AOR is the area of responsibility. That just basically means uh, the country of Afghanistan where the, the, um, the, uh, the, where the conflict is occurring. Uh, and so uh, the next, um, uh, sorry, in those uh, role three hospitals have uh, a full complement of uh, medical and surgical subspecialty care, oftentimes including neurosurgery, ENT, orthopedics, urology, ophthalmology, cardiology, pulmonary critical care, uh, anesthesia, uh, advanced radiology, and lab services, and allow for prolonged patient stays. <clears throat> the next two uh, role uh, four and five echelons of care don't exist inside the AOR. They're specifically for outside of the AOR. Uh, and uh, the closest role four ho uh, hospital uh, that services uh, the AOR of Afghanistan is uh, in Ramstein, Germany. Um, or land stool. And uh, the role five facility is definitive care, uh, which is stateside. That uh, CONUS just means continental United States. And uh, the one most commonly familiar to everybody would typically be Walter Reed uh, on the East Coast or, or Madigan uh, Joint Base in Tacoma, Washington on the, on the West Coast. Um, notably, these, uh, these two restricted um, Role three hospitals, which offer definitive care and theater, are uh, 340 miles away, uh, picked specifically to be able to uh, provide um, the most amount of access uh, throughout the country uh, to the you know, certain hotspots uh, where a lot of the tempo for uh, troops engaged in combat are. Uh, so uh, our, our hospital is quite busy uh, because it, it happens uh, to be very close to the uh, Pakistan um, Afghanistan border, which uh, I think uh, many people would recognize as, as one of the uh, hot spots. Uh, so this is the Roll 3 hospital in Bagram called CJTH or Craig Joint Theater Hospital uh, named for uh, Staff Sergeant Heath Craig who was one of the er early young medics killed in action very early on in, in 2001 during uh, the first campaign, Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, and uh, this hospital uh, was my home for seven months while on deployment there. Uh, so what kind of capabilities did we have in our deployed environment? Well, we were a small but effective outfit. Um, we had a uh, 10 ICU uh, beds available, which uh, we could flex um, when we had a mass casualty service. We could extend our, our uh, 10 ER beds into a, uh, a total of 20 uh, ICU beds. We had 20 step down beds. Uh, we had 20 floor beds. We had uh, six trauma bays, uh, again, which uh, during mass cash uh, doesn't seem like enough, but um, it, it's uh, considerable uh, given that they're the equivalent of the, you know, the the, the, uh, the trauma base that you would have uh, at Presby, um, which when I was there, I think they only had three. 
So uh, we also had the capability of operating three ORs simultaneously, which could flex to uh, six uh, ORs during a mass cache, which uh, and the way that works is that there's only three physical spaces of ORs, but there's one anesthesiologist running two anesthesia machines with two patients in a single OR, uh, which is uh, a pretty, pretty fascinating experience that uh, I got to participate in. Um, comparing the medical and surgical service, uh, service differences between the two campaigns, there was a, a decrease of almost about 50% in the medical and surgical um, ser uh, personnel from Operation During Freedom to Operation Freedom Sentinel. In May of 2014, the U.S. announced that the combat operations would end, and that just left a, a small residual force in the country until the end of 2016, which uh, prompted a significant reduction in, in the medical and surgical personnel. Um, and uh, up to that point, uh, the delivery of neurosurgical care uh, was uh, robust enough that it was worth publishing and uh, had, had, had made uh, the Journal of Neurosurgery, which I'll go over. But in brief, uh, you can see that on the uh, O, uh, o uh, FS, uh, oh, sorry, OEF, the early campaign, uh, we had a total of 14 uh, surgeons, whereas uh, spanning multiple uh, different surgical subspecialties. And then in the campaign where I was there, um, that was uh, reduced um, almost by half and so on and so forth with regard to the uh, medical uh, capabilities as, as well. So there's a tremendous decrease in the, the overall um, uh, number of uh, surgical uh, and, and medical specialists there uh, between the two campaigns. But again, the the uh, the amount of neurosurgery that was done uh, during those uh, up-tempo areas of the uh, the first campaign, uh, again, were, were uh, uh, notable enough that uh, the experience was written up, and you can see that there's a, a tremendous amount of, of cases that were being done um, in theater that spanned not only uh, emergency war trauma cases, uh, but also uh, humanita uh, humanitarian cases, which accounted for almost about a third of the overall cases being done there. Um, but notably, there were no endovascular surgery uh, procedures, or at least there were none reported in this series. So uh, all neurosurgery performed in theater to date had been uh, general or traumatic focus with the decreased case volume in uh, Operation Freedom Sentinel, restricted access to care in our role as a supporting force with fewer neurosurgical cases making it to the, the uh, CJTH or the Craig Joint Theater Hospital in the absence of an interventional vascular surgeon um, available to perform peripheral vascular support. Um, one of the questions that I had was, well, is there any role for me as a neuroendovascular surgeon in theater outside of my role to perform the trauma neurosurgery? Um, and with this talk, I'd like to address this question and I'd like to make the case that there is a role for the skill set of a neuroendovascular surgeon um, in theater. Uh, and I'll, I'll make the, that case uh, by going through a series of my endovascular uh, cases performed uh, while on deployment there. So. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, start with case one, which is a proof of concept. Um, this was a 57-year-old contractor who had a acute onset uh, severe ep epistaxis requiring uh, multiple return trips to uh, a Ford operating base uh, who was tried to uh, tr uh, be treated initially with uh, conservative means and Foley balloons, saffron pledges, uh, which was unsuccessful. He was ultimately transferred to our facility where we did have ENT capabilities. He uh, continued to have brisk arterial bleeding, uh, even with these uh, nasal balloons. Um, called rhino rockets, uh, and um, that was unsuccessful in, in attempting hemostasis. And so uh, the patient uh, underwent uh, his initial round of endoscopic evaluation to try to identify the bleeder, uh, but uh, no source of bleeding could be found. Uh, so uh, again, rhino rockets were placed in order to help pack off the bleeding and remove 24 hours later. Um, the patient had, again, multiple return trips to the, to the operating room without uh, the ability to be able to identify the source of bleeding. So um, one of my ENT colleagues, uh, Colonel Maturo, had asked me if there was any possibility uh, of me performing uh, some form of um, intraoperative vascular study or uh, a more high definition vascular study to help identify the bleeding source as uh, the, the multiple open attempts uh, were unsuccessful of identifying the source. So, um, well, the options of uh, open conventional maxillary, maxillary introstomy to identify the SPA uh, would, have, would have been a possibility, but if that wasn't the source of the bleeding, then you would have sacrificed that artery um, unnecessarily. Uh, the endovascular options uh, were, were 
essentially zero at this point because we had no dedicated endovascular suite available to perform embolization. Um, but uh, the hospital did possess two C arms uh, with uh, DSA subtraction capabilities given the previous um, deployment of uh, vas peripheral vascular uh, surgeons who had been uh, there during the initial campaign. So um, since we didn't have a an angio suite, I built one and I took these uh, two uh, C arms and positioned them orthogonally to each other amongst a uh, Jackson table uh, to simulate the workflow for intervention interventional cases that you'd have back home. Um, the uh, it took some some working to get the the two C arms to uh, work together. We had to cant it so that the the two uh, arms could be compatible and not interfere uh, with one another. But uh, we were, were able to get it, uh, and you can see on the on the screen here, you have a nice lateral projection here, and then a nice AP projection here. This is I'm, I'm imaging the the ultrasound box there just to um, see if I could if I could do it. And then this is also a good time to show you how we have uh, one anesthesia machine here, and then hiding behind the uh, C arms. This is where the other anesthesia machine is. Um, again, sometimes you have to have two patients operating simultaneously in one OR. Um, but sorry to digress. Um, so uh, the operative plan was to access the distal IMAX and embolize the uh, SPA. Um, uh, no coils were available, but uh, I created a, a slurry consisting of uh, morselized gel foam and uh, uh, took them to took the patient to the angio suite in order to uh, obtain these uh, these. Um, this DSA. Uh, unfortunately, uh, multiple attempts to try and catheterize the, the IMAX weren't successful given the limited endovascular tools available. The only micro like catheter that I had was this old cardiac stent retriever, which was far too stiff to navigate across the tortuous external circulation. Um, but again, in proof of concept, we were able to identify the external circulation, which was uh, uh, very helpful and value added. Um, and having demonstrated the feasibility of the technique, we now equipped our operating room to be able to address future epistaxis cases with the appropriate endovascular techniques. Um, the endovascular procedure uh, for this case, again, was aborted uh, and we converted to open and were able to identify it uh, endoscopically. Um, but uh, now that we had demonstrated that we had the ability to perform intraoperative uh, DSA and, and with the right tools, we, we could have taken care of this problem completely endovasculars with. Uh, so what I did next was to reach out to Pittsburgh. And uh, I phoned a friend uh, back stateside and within three weeks I received a, a goodie bag full of helpful uh, endovascular tools. Uh, and so to um, apply those uh, tools to uh, the next case, um, I, uh, I began offering my endovascular skill set to uh, the rest of uh, the uh, surgeon, the trauma surgeons there. And um, this next case helps illustrate that. So um, technically outside of my typical comfort zone, here's a case of a patient who took a, a round to the distal femur and had a, a penetrating wound to, uh, wound to the, the distal femur with uh, pulseless lower extremities requiring an open exploration at the Roll 2 hospital. So at that field hospital, um, the distal popliteal artery was bypassed. Uh, and the patient was, uh, so a temporary shunt was inserted and, and he was uh, sent to us for definitive bypass, which is done with a saphenous uh, vein harvest and um, uh, definitive bypass by removing the old shunt and, and sewing in the, the saphenous bypass. Uh, here's the CTA, which uh, in the sagittal and axial imaging demonstrates transection of the popliteal artery with the red arrow, with the red arrow and a thrombus in the popliteal vein at the site of injury. Um, the patient uh, was taken to our hospital and taken for re-exploration. Uh, the popliteal artery and vein were identified and approximately eight centimeter defect uh, was, was noted. Uh, the silastic shunts uh, were, were in place, um, but uh, at the conclusion of the procedure, there were no palpable pulses in the edematous right lower extremity. Uh, there were no Dopplers. Um, again, the leg was quite swollen and there was no uh, dorsalis um, so what were our options at that point? You have a, a patient who's uh, sustained a, a tremendous injury to his lower extremity and uh, no way to um, 
no way to know uh, distal to the area where his shunt was if and when there was a problem uh, without having to take the patient from the operating room and, and back to, to the uh, uh, radiology to obtain yet another uh, CTA. So uh, we're dealt with the uh, differential diagnosis of a propagated clot, a dissection for the existing injury. Uh, it could just be a dimitous leg. He may not have pulses just because uh, our equipment isn't working well enough or, and we just can't detect it through the swollen leg. Um, and so he would have needed a distal exploration. Um, and so uh, you can do that, uh, but that takes up a valuable OR time. And um, uh, the other option would be to do intraoperative angiography in order to identify the problem. So again, with our new uh, bag of goodies, we're able to uh, get obtain transfemoral access and go up and over uh, to access the, um, the uh, femoral artery and, and do a femoral artery runoff. Uh, and therefore, my, my intraoperative angio suite was um, up and running, and we easily performed uh, to the, the, the procedure in order to demonstrate that the shunt was patent and that uh, we could proceed with the graft. The distal runoff was fine, and it was really just a kind of technical limitation of our, uh, our, our sonogram and the patient's swollen leg. And we were also able to, to demonstrate that once the saphenous vein was uh, sewn in, the, the bypass was up and running. And again, there was no problem with the graft. So um, again, we've the the theme here is that we kind of once we've established the proof of concept, we can kind of gradually escalate our, our abilities uh, and, and and rise to the the next greater and greater challenge. So this next case is uh, uh, emphasizes the need to be able to work even further outside of your comfort zone uh, for patients um, not eligible for evacuation to a higher role facility, care must be administered in theater. And, and again, this is a case done out of necessity because this is a patient who was not eligible for uh, being evacuated uh, outside of, uh, out of the theater. So this is a 32 year old Afghan national uh, who was seen an outside facility uh, in Pakistan for uh, back pain and, and neck pain um, and was ultimately found to have a L2 vertebral body uh, lesion that was concerning for pathologic fracture. Um, this is a, he was a translator who are in very high demand. And so uh, this guy was discharged from the hospital in Pakistan and then and sent back out to the field. And, and while he was out walking and, and uh, uh, performing his job as a, as a translator, he had a, a fall uh, and that resulted in a very proximal uh, uh, peritrochanteric uh, pathologic femur fracture. Ultimately his biopsy would show that he had widely metastatic lung cancer. Um, here's a picture of his uh, femur fracture, which was uh, rotted. And um, after his surgery, the patient developed profound dyspnea and, and the CTE showed that he had uh, multiple PEs and, um, and, and needed to be uh, anticoagulated. Um, given the patient's hypercoagulable state with a high suspicion for malignancy, which again, ultimately confirmed that he did have lung cancer uh, and the need to go uh, to the operating room for multiple times for his orthopedic injuries, uh, the request was that he, if we could place a, uh, an IVC filter, uh, it would help uh, minimize his risk of uh, additional uh, pulmonary embolus burden uh, and, and, and decrease his risk for, for going into heart failure uh, because he, he already demonstrated some, uh, as, uh, some evidence of, of right ventricular heart strain. Um, so it's great to want to have an IVC filter place, um, but there was no end user to install it. Um, the hospital commander had asked me if this was something that I could help out with and if there was any way to be able to get it done safely that uh, um, that, that he would he would definitely appreciate us uh, trying to trying to do that. And so I, I told him, of course, I'd, I'd be happy to do it. I just, I just need to learn how to do it real quick. So where else other than YouTube can you uh, become familiar with how to install an IVC filter? Uh, uh, without being a resident in vascular surgery. So um, this is uh, the IVC uh, runoff that, that I, I did in order to make sure that I was below the, uh, the renal veins. Uh, and this is my post-deployment IVC filter. And again, we had these IVC filters left over because again, we had um, peripheral vascular uh, surgeons in theater uh, many years ago during the previous campaign. So they just happened to be on the shelf. Uh, and um, ultimately, I would <laughs> come to be uh, the, the vascular service and, and uh, have to put in uh, three more of these devices. Only one of the three filters was retrieved and retrieval was performed via a right jugular approach using a, a 12 French sheath. Um, and that was uh, thankfully performed without comp complication. Um, and uh, 
these cases, again, were done out of necessity. They're not part of my practice, uh, even though I'm back in the States doing uh, endovascular uh, here in Atlanta. The next case underscores the need to utilize not only my endovascular skill set, but also the open vascular skill set. So this is the case of a 49 year old uh, Kurdistani national uh, who went to an outpatient clinic complaining of he uh, headache and nausea. Um, she ultimately would uh, develop mental status changes and become somnolent. Uh, where um, she was taken to a local uh, facility where a uh, CT scan was done and then ultimately she blew a pupil and was transferred to our facility emergently. Uh, her CAT scan shows here a, an acute left-sided convexity subdural with a significant amount of midline shift in this uh, posterior occipital intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Um, differential, uh, ABM, ruptured mycotic aneurysm, duralapy fistula, spontaneous ICH from a fall, uh, hemorrhagic metast metastatic disease, all, all are on the board, but uh, we were able to get a CTA real quick, which confirmed my suspicions that this patient did indeed have a uh, spetsomartin grade three uh, uh, arterial venous malformation with uh, multiple uh, uh, nidal aneurysms one of which had bled. Uh, you can see circled in yellow there, uh, just subjacent to the uh, occipital uh, parenchymal hemorrhage. Um, so she underwent a left decompressive hemicraniectomy of the subdural uh, with placement of the flap in the abdomen, which is uh, typical. Um, and I specifically left the AVM alone, uh, not knowing if she would survive uh, the initial operation. Um, so what should be done with the AVM. So the patient did uh, would, would ultimately uh, be able to uh, survive her injury and her, her neurologic exam improved significantly. So uh, the challenges here is that again, we are under limited uh, medical rules of engagement and this patient basically violated every single one and through kind of a back door uh, was able to get access to our hospital. So we have a foreign national from Kyrgyzstan uh, with only coverage through her contractor and uh, limited resources in the patient's home country. I actually contacted their patient's home country uh, capital hospital to try and see if this is something they could do there. And they said that uh, that would be pushing the limits of, of their capabilities. Um, so they don't necessarily have great um, open vascular surgery services in the patient's home country. Uh, the nearest biplane with interventional capabilities was the United Arab Emirates. And um, the, for political reasons, the, the medical rules of engagement prevented from the Department of Justice from being able to provide specific medical evac to this individual given the humanitarian scope. So we we're kind of in a, between a rock and a hard place. So I, um, in order to gain a little bit more information about the patient's AVM, I took her for uh, uh, back to my angio suite and uh, studied the AVM a little bit better to try and identify uh, the, the arterial lymph feeders, uh, the location of those perinatal aneurysms, and uh, get a better sense of what exactly we were dealing with here. So um, yeah, here's a, a CTA that I, 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 I obtained. Um, realizing that this is something that we were going to have to take care of in theater and we were able to get clearance from uh, from the hospital commander on um, uh, because the, again the patient couldn't be shipped out until she had definitive care um, we we started planning for her surgery to have this resected uh, in in the OR so I sent her for a, a CTA and you can see here that and she has these uh, little EKG leads. This is a poor man's fiducial in order to try and figure out exactly uh, the location of her, her AVM uh, with respect to her skin um, because she had a, a large uh, reverse question mark uh, flap from her decompressive hemicrany that uh, I, I didn't want to uh, violate the blood supply to uh, this part of her flap that would have to ultimately be teed into the existing incision. So uh, you can see uh, that would be the uh, this is the teed in portion of her incision that I use these these fiducials to plan for uh, the occipital artery, which would be uh, providing blood supply to that area. Um, and uh, anyways, used all of these uh, imaging modalities to, to help get us a, as safe as possible uh, return trip to the operating room to help provide definitive care for her AVM. Um, so again, just to reiterate the, the challenges that this case posed, um, I waited about three weeks for her uh, cerebral edema from her initial hemorrhage to resolve, and then uh, ultimately proceeded with uh, resection and antrop angio. So you can see here in, in the left panel, uh, the small aneurysm clips that were left over um, from uh, many, many years ago that we still had on the shelf, uh, where I clipped those, um, they, they turned out to be uh, not nidal aneurysms, but uh, very proximal flow related aneurysms. Uh, so those were clipped uh, and the arterial inflow uh, clipped off uh, as well. And uh, the AVM was resected uh, and an interop 
uh, angio uh, demonstrated complete resection. So it was a very uh, gratifying case. We were ultimately able to get her uh, transported back to her family in, in uh, Bishkek, which is the capital of Kyrgyzstan. So the next case highlights uh, the importance of being part of a team. Um, this is a 36 year old Afghan National Army member who sustained a gunshot wound to the left femur. Um, resulting in a subtrochanteric femur fracture. Uh, the wound was treated with a tourniquet, as is standard for all lower extremity uh, injuries at, at, at an outside field hospital. Uh, she was ultimate, he was ultimately evacuated to a, a Roll 2 facility where the uh, SFAS team um, converted the tourniquet to a pressure dressing uh, and then placed the patient in, tra in traction. Um, at, that pa at that time, the patient had palpable pulses um, in the lower extremity. Uh, at the, on the leg of injury, um, and then he was shipped to us uh, for definitive care. And when he arrived at our facility about, I think it was about eight hours later, he, he no longer had pulses available. Um, and uh, a CTA of the left lower extremity demonstrated that he had a, a large subocclusive thrombus at the distal popliteal artery bif bifurcation, which was most likely related to the um, very prolonged uh, tourniquet time that he had on that leg to prevent uh, massive bleeding. So when I look at this, I see two vertebral arteries for forming the basilar trunk, uh, real estate that I'm quite familiar with and, and have been in plenty of time with an aspiration catheter to mechanically retrieve a clot during a, a basilar um, occlusion. So, um, uh, you know, again, you have, if you think about this, uh, obviously it's in the leg, but if you think of it as one vertebral artery, one vertebral artery and a basilar here, well, you're just turning this problem on its head and coming the other way. If you want to do an aspiration here, you just come down the distal popliteal artery and try and suck these out. Um, well, uh, the question was whether or not I could perform an, uh, an endovascular thrombectomy or with this patient who already had a uh, tremendous uh, orthopedic operation to undergo, would he also need a, a very long extended operation by uh, the general surgeon to explore his uh, distal lower extremity vasculature in order to fetch out these clots. So, um, you know, I'd asked uh, our, our trauma czar to uh, let me have a shot because we had plenty of aspiration catheters available. So I took a 070 DAC uh, accessed through a transfemoral approach on the contralateral side to go up and over and uh, in a couple passes was able to retrieve a significant amount of clot burden uh, panel a here uh, that uh, <laughs> these arrows are off a little bit uh, but uh, the distal popliteal artery uh, demonstrating the the clot burden here at the bifurcation and then uh, after the first pass we were able to revascularize the D, uh, the ta and then after the uh, the second pass able to uh, completely revascularize uh, the patient's lower extremity and saving him the morbidity of uh, the attendant uh, open procedure. Um, this next case uh, demonstrates uh, the importance of uh, understanding your limitations, but then also um, learning from, from your failures. Um, again, we had kind of pushed the envelope from a, an endovascular perspective while there, and uh, um, in, in an effort to try and help take care of ever increasing challenging cases uh, when this came through the door, uh, which is a, a zone two injury, uh, which we would ultimately find out to be basically a complete transection of not only the internal carotid artery, but also a skull based uh, transection of the patient's internal jugular. Um, this is something that uh, from an open procedure uh, can be quite scary, uh, um, but uh, also very intimidating from an endovascular perspective as well. So uh, this is a patient who um, was uh, taken to the operating room and uh, his neck was being prepped out um, in order to be uh, explored so that the ENT and trauma surgeons could identify the uh, source of uh, carotid bleeding. And usually zone two uh, injuries are, are ones that are, are maximally accessible uh, because you don't have to contend with uh, um, any of the, uh, the challenges associated with zone three injuries, which are, are, are typically uh, from about C4 all the way to the skull base or any of the uh, zone one injuries, um, which uh, oftentimes need to have the chest cracked in order to get proximal control over the vascular injuries. So zone two injuries are typically downplayed. Uh, and so this was uh, something that our, our ENT and, and, and gen, uh, trauma surgeons thought that they could take care of very easily. Um, I had made myself available in the event that they needed a balloon occlusion uh, uh, very proximally of the, of the uh, side of injury in the, the left carotid there. 
Um, and uh, before I could get into the room, they started prepping the neck and the patients already uh, previously explored uh, neck just began hemorrhaging um, uh, uncontrollably. Uh, unfortunately, this patient expired because uh, they were unable to get uh, proximal control uh, despite having uh, cracked his chest and, and, and obtained uh, uh, proximal control at the uh, basically uh, the branches off the aorta. Uh, but uh, from this, uh, uh, we, we, we had a, a much healthier respect for uh, the uh, vascular pathology the next time we had a zone two injury, which came in a couple weeks later. Uh, this is a, an injury in a U.S. Special Forces operator, which uh, makes the, the outcome all the more gratifying. So uh, this is a patient who sustained an improvised explosive device blast, which uh, peppered the entire right hemi body with shrapnel from head to toe. Uh, his neck um, was explored at one of the outside Rolf the two, Rolf two facilities as well, but they, they were unable to identify any carotid injury. He comes to our, our shop and uh, at, uh, uh, this CTA was performed, which demonstrates this kind of apical pseudoaneurysm with uh, a contained extravasation. So um, the, the question is, well, what to do? Well, again, um, our, our previous experience of exploring uh, zone two injuries uh, was, was met with um, significant challenges. And this is a patient who is already developing uh, strokes based on his CT with the red and yellow arrows uh, demonstrating areas of hypodensities. Um, and uh, this is uh, clearly a lesion that needs to be treated. And uh, if there is an option to, to take care of this endovascularly, we wanted to uh, take advantage of that. So um, I took the patient to the operating room, uh, was able to obviously uh, very clearly identify the, uh, the, the injury uh, and was able to put one covered stent uh, across the site of injury and then ultimately uh, a second covered stent in order to secure the, uh, the entire length of, of the injury. And uh, this uh, young, I think he was 31 year old uh, special forces operator was able to uh, ultimately be uh, discharged uh, back stateside and uh, because this was part of my board collection, I had to get uh, long term follow up on this patient was able to uh, finally reconnect with him uh, several months uh, after my return. And uh, he uh, informed me that uh, not only had he made a tremendous recovery, uh, being essentially um, bed bound, uh, but uh, in, in hemiplegic, but had fully recovered to the point where um, the Seattle Seahawks, he lives in the, the Seattle area, had uh, invited him to be the uh, uh, holder of the American flag. You can see here this individual, I hope this projects well over the internet, uh, holding the American flag here. Uh, so when the Seattle uh, Seahawks played the Buffalo Bills, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to uh, recover and we run out from the uh, football field holding the American flag, which was a uh, um, very, very gratifying to to get as part of his follow up uh, six or seven months down the road. And then the last case that I'd like to uh, uh, discuss is is probably the most unique uh, of the of the seven uh, that we've talked about. Um, this is uh, again a devastating injury of a uh, local Afghan national. Um, um, police member who uh, had sustained a, an improvised uh, explosive device um, very, very close to the side of injury and, and his entire body was peppered uh, with not only uh, metal shrapnel, but but also uh, um, uh, third degree burns over the, the entire uh, left hemi body. And this resulted in him having uh, a fungal infection uh, which um, devastated his soft tissues. So uh, long story short, he would ultimately get to the point where he needed basically a uh, um, dislocation and in, in, uh, pelvic disarticulation of this, not, excuse me, not pelvic dislocation, femoral uh, disarticulation at the pelvis uh, because this entire left uh, limb was no longer viable and we couldn't uh, control the, the spread of his fungal infection anymore. So when these procedures are, are typically done, uh, they, they often result uh, in about anywhere from you know, six to, to nine liters of blood loss, uh, given the amount of uh, um, extensive soft tissue dissection and uh, orthopedic uh, bone work that needs to be done. And so my orthopedic colleagues had just asked if there was anything we could do from a, a blood control standpoint uh, given that uh, they would not have access um, to the internal iliacs that provide uh, a lot of the, the hemorrhage uh, 
associated with the, the disarticulation process. So um, we, we had you know, clear cut access uh, into his popliteal artery and vein, uh, which uh, w made it very, very easy for us to uh, thread um, balloon kind catheters up to the uh, distal iliacs and use those as kind of internal tourniquets. Uh, and this uh, enabled us to perform uh, the entire disarticulation process with a, a minimal amount of blood loss, uh, again, because we had shut down all the inflow and prevented uh, all of the outflow. Um, so uh, anything we were losing would have, would have just been you know, blood that was uh, in, in the, uh, the extremity anyways. Uh, this uh, resulted in us to be able to um, uh, not have to use our precious blood resources, which uh, are often in, in, in very uh, high demand um, and, and not always readily available. So uh, this is a kind of a big win and um, very unusual case uh, for us to do, but worked out very well. Uh, and again, this is my uh, team that I just wanted to point out. These are uh, on the panel left here. This is uh, Colonel Chance Henderson. Uh, he was one of our orthopedic uh, surgeons who was out there. This is uh, Colonel Maturo, who uh, was uh, the ENT doctor uh, with whom I worked in order to help um, perform the epistaxis case and the proof of concept. And this is uh, Colonel Jamie Rand, who was our trauma uh, czar. Uh, and then uh, here I am, the lowest ranking member of the whole team, uh, a lowly major in the background. Um, but uh, this is this is uh, this is my squad. And uh, a special thanks to uh, Dr. Jankowitz, Brian Jankowitz, who uh, was um, able to send me the uh, catheters needed in order to help uh, expand my role as a neuroendovascular surgeon in theater and be able to do uh, these, these very interesting cases. And uh, also a, a very special thank you to Melissa Lukehart uh, for, for getting them in the mail to us. Uh, this is, uh, well, um, I'm not I'm not sure if anybody had seen Dr. Jankowitz's American flag that he had in his room before he uh, departed, but uh, this was this was the flag uh, that we had given him as a thank you. It was flown in uh, one of the F-15s and also flown over uh, Craig Joint Theater Hospital, uh, but that hangs in his, his office. Um, and uh, with that, I'll finish up here and just some some closing remarks uh, to all the, the faculty. Uh, a sincere thank you. Um, it's uh, I'm so appreciative for uh, the seven short years that I have with everyone, and I can't thank every single one of you enough. Uh, and, uh, and to all the residents, um, you only train once, so train hard and make it count because you never know when you'll be the only neurosurgeon for an entire country. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. What an incredible presentation and uh, career that you've had thus far. Uh, we're going to begin with our Q&A portion of the presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions questions as we can in the allotted time. Dr. Friedlander, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you, Justin. And uh, Phil, thank you very much for your service. Obviously, this is uh, amazing what you've done and how you've uh, helped uh, so many people in need. I remember uh, a number of uh, cases uh, when you were a resident where you know patients come into the emergency room with different kinds of uh, injury. I remember a few that have uh, you know, fairly significant uh, and unusual injuries, and then you have to innovate, and then you innovate, but you're at Presby where you have anything you want. I mean, from experience uh, in terms of uh, other uh, residents, and certainly all the faculty are here, uh, from equipment, um, you know, anything you need is, uh, do, is, is right there for you, versus uh, obviously being uh, all the different cases you described, that uh, both you have less people to talk with at least immediately and the resources uh, uh, are limited as, as you described. How, how does, uh, obviously you, you changed the, with your experience as a resident, as a, uh, uh, you know, your, your, your persona changes after seeing so many good things and bad things, but obviously I, I think it's, it's a different level when you're in Afghanistan in the middle there. How, how do you think you're different as a person or how do you appreciate either resources or life differently from being in such a you know moving experience uh yeah yeah uh, great question and the you know i think to the point of the uh, comfort levels uh i i i have discovered that uh i i enjoy working at the limits uh, of uh, you know at the, li the limits of your comfort zone because i think 
it's it's very easy to, uh, as you said, work inside uh, a, a paradigm where you really have everything at your disposal, and and uh, you know the, the, the challenges uh, are. Are, are, are not, do I have access? Do I have help? Can I get this study? You know, so I think that working at the limits of your comfort zone really push you as a, as a resident or as, a, as an attending or as a fellow to really try and get to that next level. So um, I, like I said, I really enjoy the challenges that Afghanistan uh, posed for me because, you know, I didn't think a lot of the stuff that we did was going to be possible, but we certainly weren't going to find out if we didn't try. And so, uh, again, pushing the limits of your comfort zone, just applying the principles that you learn uh, in fellowship and, and, and training um, really allows you to kind of figure out um, if you really what you're capable of. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Uh, we have a lot of really interesting questions that I'm, I'm quite interested uh, in myself. Uh, first, uh, what was a typical day for you like as a doctor in Afghanistan? <laughs> uh, it's 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 boredom punctuated by absolute chaos. So uh, what what, um, what 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 tends to happen is the you know the the tempo the, uh, from a fighting perspective is really the only is the main driver for how busy you're going to be from a surgeon uh, perspective. So when uh, during the fighting season, which typically lasts from uh, uh, early May all the way to November. Uh, you, you, there, there tends to be daily bombings, okay? And so these, uh, um, th there's these mortar rockets which are launched up and over the walls that uh, encircles uh, the uh, perimeter of the base. And so um, usually on a daily basis, there's an alarm that goes off uh, at all hours of the, uh, of the day and night, which um, kind of signify that there's an incoming mortar round. And so um, that is one of the, the the fun things that you have to look forward to, and you have to run to seek cover and throw on your armor and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that was one of the <laughs> one of the huge inconveniences up front that just became part of uh, uh, the, the the daily um, norm. Um, and then the other daily routine was listening to the uh, the F-15s take off because they have this um, just the the the, the runway on the base is right next to the hospital. And so you, you hear these planes taking off, which are taking off with afterburners on because they have to gather enough height um, in their short runway during takeoff in order to kind of get out of range of, of enemy fire. And so they're doing all these combat takeoffs. But uh, as a consequence of that, they're always hitting their afterburners uh, on the very short runway. And so you have this enormously powerful uh, sound uh, and energy just rattling the the hospital that, that goes on every two hours. It's <laughs> it's uh, like a little alarm clock. Uh, and so that was um, those are the those are the things that you always got to look forward to. Um, and during the tempos where things were busy during the fighting times, you're typically getting a lot of mass casualties. Some of them were known, some of them were unknown, um, but uh, uh, if you're taking care of mass casualties, you're basically just operating, uh, you know, for, you know, anywhere from, well, depending, if there was just a neurosurgical case, obviously I would just take care of that, but I was oftentimes helping out the general surgeons and the, and the orthopedic surgeons, and it, it would typically run from anywhere from four to eight hours at a time, and then, you know, after the mass cash is taken care of, um, I mean, you could go two weeks not doing a case. Um, at which time the, the majority of your time was spent um, you know, working out. So uh, you, we were in the gym a lot uh, during our downtime um, and, and, uh, and logging my cases <laughs> uh, for, for, for the board. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, it, it's, uh, it's boredom punctuated by a maelstrom of entropy. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, how is operating in a military hospital different from that of a regular hospital in the U.S. Oh, uh, it, <laughs> uh, well, uh, it depends. Do you mean a military hospital in theater or a military hospital stateside? Um, either way, they're, they're still kind of similar. Um, I think that the common thread is well, we don't have what you want, but we have what you're going to get. And uh, you just have to kind of get used to using what's available. All right. And so, you know, it, it's it's always great to have a, a three Tesla high resolution MRI scan with contrast for your brain tumor case. 
but you know sometimes a non-contrasted uh 22 slice head ct is all you're going to get and, and so again you just learning how to make do and not letting that um prevent you from being able to accomplish what you need to medically or surgically is is really the common theme i think amongst uh all military surgery excellent uh what led you to choose your career path in neurosurgery uh that that's that's a that's a much longer answer that the um but the long and short of it is uh i, gr I grew up as a inveterate sailor uh in in the new orleans area and one of the boats that i used to do uh, be a crew member on the, the as a four decker was called the synapse and uh uh the the boat's captain and owner was a, a guy who had been a, a neurosurgeon um for about 45 years and uh he was a, a neuros he was a neurosurgeon in vietnam uh and obtained uh, a purple heart um while in vietnam and then i think 34 years later while still a neurosurgeon he uh and he was in the army um he decided to re-enlist uh as as a, a neurosurgeon in the army for operation desert storm and so and his name is michael carey um and uh dr carey uh would always talk to me about neurosurgery and how much how wonderful of a, of, a, of a field it was and it was just such an impressive story to hear uh, that at the very least piqued my interest um and then uh, i kind of pursued it um by going to the operating room operating room with him and um seeing all the wonderful cases that he did and, and that that's that was kind of my initial foray into, into neurosurgery um and and uh, that's the rest is history that's great uh, how did the University of Pittsburgh residency prepare you for the military? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I honestly think that it's the best training on the planet, just given the breadth and depth of uh, stuff that you're exposed to. Um, the, 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 the training at, at, at Presby, again, I cannot say enough about the, uh, the, the level of autonomy, the level of didactics. Uh, it, the ability to be able to do infolded fellowships. Uh, it, it is an extraordinarily unique place uh, where you have um, uh, a, a robust, I mean, every subspecialty of neurosurgery is so robust at Pittsburgh that it, it doesn't matter what your interests are, you're going to find the best the, the center of excellence probably in the world in order to uh, become the best at whatever component of neurosurgery that you want to do uh, from trauma to stereotactic radio surgery skull base vascular endovascular i mean it, it is all there um, so i think that um, being able to participate in a residency that offers that high level of excellence in virtually every subspecialty in neurosurgery um, again i don't think that the importance of that can be overstated Thank you. Uh, I think we have room for one more question here, Dr. Perry. Uh, good one to end on. Uh, what was your most memorable moment of your residency at the University of Pittsburgh? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, the, the most memorable moment for me <laughs> was, was the, it had to have been the last day. Um, there's this tremendous sense of letdown as, as you walk out carrying your cardboard box of personal effects from the chief's office. And when you walk out, and I walked out through the School of Medicine out onto, you know, um, oh, I forget the street, um, but I remember walking out and just thinking it, it's over, that's it. And a uh, uh, combination of uh, a sense of pride, uh, sense of accomplishment, uh, but also fear, thinking, I'm not sure I, I did everything that I need to do. And so um, that 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 very kind of unusual mix of emotions, I think, has never left me. But um, certainly the fear has has, has decreased uh, tremendously because, like I said, um, if you're ever in doubt of whether or not you're well trained enough at the University of Pittsburgh, um, I think your first couple of years out uh, are enough to uh, alleviate that fear. Well, that's really great to hear. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you again for today. What an incredible presentation. Again, um, we not only thank you for your service to patients, but we also thank you for the service to, to our country as well. 
Uh, thank you to our attendees. Again, if you have any questions or would like to learn more, more about ways to support the Department of Neurosurgery, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Perry and Dr. Freelander. Would you like to please close it out for us for the day? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Phil. And you definitely need, did everything you needed to do here. You were incredibly well trained and uh, very proud of everything that uh, that you did as a resident uh, and since. So I could tell you, you definitely did everything. Um, so again, thank you for, for, for joining us and for everything that you do. Uh, next week, uh, we're taking off uh, and the week uh, after, uh, we'll be uh, seeing Dr. Christopher Standard. He's from the PMNR department. He's a specialist in in back pain and what's important for us is to learn how to manage uh, back pain uh, completely uh, as a whole and uh, to, to be able to collaborate with people that don't do surgery as well as the surgeon. So Dr. Standard, uh, really a fantastic uh, clinician. He'll be joining us uh, then. So till then, have a fabulous uh, weekend and week and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.